unfamiliar, you know, actually telling people what you believe about Jesus? If you were talking about Jesus. <laughs> Not always easy to do. Uh, anyone find that unfamiliar? No. Good. Anybody want to come up and evangelize the room with what you heard? <laughs> yes. Anything new and interesting you want to share? Good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Rather than this is the first time you've ever, ever done something like that. Because we're told in you know, Mark 16 to go and proclaim the gospel to all creatures. Right? So that is the, the initial proclamation. What are you proclaiming? That content that you just talked about would be kind of a, a stab or a return to or a revisioning of the content of that, that initial proclamation, right? And so we have to get a grip on what that first proclamation is for us and for our listeners, whoever that is. If it's someone in an elevator, if it's your brother back from Jericho visiting relatives, or it's someone that you are actually in ministry with or to. And that first proclamation was not, probably, I don't know about your tables, was not the most important part of the good news is Jesus is teaching on divorce. <laughs> Correct me if wrong. Or the content of the first proclamation is an explanation of the Eucharist, how it works. Mm -hmm. Or an explanation of the virgin birth. That work on an elevator. <laughs> <laughs> Better be a tall building. <laughs> if anybody came up with those, well, um, good luck. Um, and sorry to bother you with the Greek, but you know someone was going to have to do it. Uh, right, just to return to one of these words that we all love, uh, the kerygma, right, the content of the first proclamation. And it's generally the same, but sometimes it's different given the person that's talking or those that are listening. This is one Christian's formulation of the kerygma, or the first proclamation, right, the first proclamation. is The kerygma is Trinitarian. The fire of the Spirit is given in the form of tongues and leads us to believe in Jesus Christ, who by his death and resurrection reveals and communicates to us the Father's infinite mercy. Anybody come up with that at your table? <laughs> oh, I love it! Of course! It would be the very high tone thing. Yeah. Right? So that's Pope Francis with, you know, a lot of time to write for a team of writers, as you know. You know but uh, pulling this together uh, in that, it's pretty great, right? It's got it all. It's got, it's got fire, it's got uh, tongues, it's got belief, resurrection, Communication, mercy, it has all of it going in there. And who doesn't want that, right? Is that more or less what you were sharing at the table? Um, yes, Carol? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> and if it wasn't, the question might be why not? You weren't you know, hitting some of these pieces about the Trinity, some of these pieces about Jesus, some of these pieces about the resurrection, the Spirit, any of those. There's tons of that that could be in that first proclamation when you're maybe engaging someone on the street, in an elevator, or even in your own home. So if it wasn't in your in that conversation, was it because you don't know these things to be true about God? You don't know that God saves you? You, know, you don't know that? Or is it because you don't have a lot of experience actually talking to people about that first proclamation? That core piece? That, that proclamation that you do in response, or we do in response to go forth and proclaim to all nations? So it's either you don't know or you have an experience. Are you an ignorant evangelist or a shy one? <laughs> now I would say, having grown up, I grew up on a ranch about uh, three hours west of here. And uh, we're a lot of things, but um, really pushy about what we believe, not really. <laughs> not really at all. I mean. You could die a very, you know, a, you could live a very long life and die in your bed without ever a Catholic knocking on your door in Eastern Oregon. <laughs> probably the same in this culture, right? So probably a shy evangelist. Or perhaps you have not yet identified that, that and where God saved you. You personally, where did God actually save you? Where does God continue to save you? And you've not claimed as a reality that the death and resurrection of Jesus is the full revelation of God's love for us. That those are just words, you know? You haven't actually said, that's actually what happened to me. That that's how I experienced God's love for me. Is that God, that Jesus did this. And 
if we can't talk about God saving us, if you can't talk about it, God saving you, and you're in a position of leading, or teaching, or preaching, we just need to quit. <laughs> you need to quit leading, teaching, and preaching. Find someone who can speak from that experience, and go follow them. And let them do the preaching. And let them do the teaching, right? Because once we claim the reality of God's love for us through the salvific action of Christ, right? We start living our lives in the light of this reality. Our lives are going to change. There is no way around it. No life change. You might think, hmm, I wonder if this happened. Our lives are going to start meaning something to us. They already mean a lot to God. But they're going to start meaning something to us. And we're going to be able to rest deeply in the reality of God's mercy. Father's infinite mercy. We're going to be able to rest easy in that. And then we know we're saved and we're redeemed and we get it and we got it and I bet you can't keep quiet about it. <laughs> if it's actually happened. Has anyone ever had a crush on someone? <laughs> yeah, right. You had a crush on someone and the person's name just comes up all the time for no fair reason. Right? That name just keeps popping up, popping up. No matter what the conversation, I mean, if you're in the middle of a deep crush, someone can ask you the most innocent question and, you know, maybe ask you directions on the street to a restaurant. They could say, um, excuse me, but where is El Rinconcito? And you don't even say, hey, funny you should ask. You know, my, uh, my, uh, uh, I was going to go to dinner with my boyfriend, Pete Smith, but then we didn't. It has nothing to do with the question. <laughs> it was an opportunity for you to bring up the name, right? All the time, at any pause in conversation, you bring up the name of that person that you are fixated on that you have this crush on, right? Same with this first proclamation. Those disciples go forth, and they respond to that not just because, I guess God just told us to go forth. <laughs> no, it's because they'd had this deep, rich experience where when they went forth, it came out out of this deep, compelling experience of attraction, love, and connection with the living God from people who have been saved and knew it. And that same connection has to be what fires us up towards other people for any of this education business or this preaching stuff. And we are going to become, through that rich experience, a sun rather than a black hole, which would be the whole Star Wars piece, right? <laughs> we're going to become a lamp, perhaps in a dark corner, but we're going to be a lamp nonetheless. And then there is this connection between bonding knowledge of God's love for us and then sharing with other people that that's the connection we're looking at right there. More from Pope Francis. Okay. On the lips of the catechist, the first proclamation must ring out over and over, Jesus Christ loves you, he gave his life to save you, and now he's living at your side every day to enlighten, strengthen, and free you. Pretty spectacular. Anyone work here as a catechist? I should see every hand go up, because we're all Christians, right? Uh, we're all catechists all the time. And is this on our lips all the time, all the time? Or have we gone a little bit cold? So when this happens, watch out, because you're going to be on fire in your work. And somehow through prayer and experience, you should have been touched by God and know it, claim it, preach it, and teach it. Know it, claim it, preach it, and teach it. That this experience happened. And somehow God who loves us all, all the time. Somehow we were able to turn from ourselves and experience a little bit of that and then be on fire from it and say, wow, that happened and I want to tell you, I want to tell you, I want to tell you. Right? All that's possible. So there you are, bringing up Jesus, talking about Jesus, going on and on about Jesus and God's loving mercy. And like a love relationship, you are about to change. Because you are going to begin to resemble your beloved you see that with old couples? <laughs> it's hard to tell them apart. Wait, who are you? Oh, what? You know, their hair is the same. They begin to look very much the same. Or people and their dogs love their dogs. They presume they look exactly the same. I had a friend who used to maintain this as a part of his gospel, that people always look like their dogs. Well, he moved to New York, and I said to him, I said, well, what are the people like in New York? And he said, well, there's a lot of pit bulls. <laughs> like, oh, well, that's what explains how the people are like in New York. <laughs> so my brother Andy and his wife Joan, uh, they uh, they married for for quite a while. But 
he loves Harley Davidsons, and she loves miniature schnauzers. <laughs> like, okay, well, good luck to you, you know? So that's, that's what they're doing. And you can see this kind of happen where they began to like the thing of the, that the beloved liked. So on the back of the Harley Davidson, there was this small sticker of a schnauzer. My brother Andy said, well, I'll just put it there. And then Joan was, you know, walked by in a, you know, black leather vest. <laughs> you know, I was like, wait a second, what's that about? And eventually, you know, there were more schnauzers and more Harley Davidsons in the family. <laughs> She's, you know, like, I'm sure I got Harley Davidson, why not? And he has his own schnauzer, we'll see. And you think, now wait, how, how did that happen? Because in a love relationship, you begin to resemble what it is you love, or who it is that you love. So, no one told them that they should get interested in schnauzers or Harley Davidson. No one informed them. They didn't have to look at the Bible to say, uh, looks like if I'm dating someone with a schnauzer, I need to get a damn dog. No. <laughs> no one told them that. It's because they did it because the person interested in that, they're interested in that person. So everyone here loves God? Yes? yes? Good. What is God interested in, huh? Take another 10 minutes at your table. And what's God interested in? Get a list going if that's going to be helpful. It's a big guy with a lot of hobbies. And again, everyone speaks, everyone listens. 